Right, a, a couple of years ago, a very elegant, very successful lady who I know said to my girlfriend, Harry is a very nice person, but there's nothing spiritual about him. Well, she doesn't know the half of it. So I'll tell you three non-spiritual stories. One where I called an American head of state a whore, and he thanked me. The other where I spoke to the holiest man in the world, and we had a riotous conversation. The third, I'll sort of leave. The president was a man named Richard M. Nixon, and he came to Bangkok when I was there, and it was between presidencies, so nobody wanted to interview him. I was working at the Bangkok Post, and the political people didn't want to see him. I said, I will go to see this man. So we sat there. He had come in. He was representing Pepsi-Cola or something like that, the Voice of America guy, myself, and three people from the Thai Foreign Ministry were there. And he was absolutely horrified as we asked the questions. I wanted to say that worms fell out of his mouth, but I have too much respect for worms because they actually do things for the world before that. So I'll say that oil or dirt fell out of his mouth as he spoke and he said, I'd rather not answer that question, and he went on. Well, I thought, this is a man of such absolute hatred and vindictiveness. This was long before Watergate, too. So then finally, we were supposed to say goodbye to him. And so we sat there, the voice of America, it's not sat there, we stood there. The voice of America man was first, two foreign ministry people were second, and I was third. And there was another man, another from a Thai newspaper there. So he, typical politician, he would shake hands with one and look at the other, get his double-faced sort of thing coming along. He was a vicious and awful person. The man before me didn't speak English very well, but it was a Thai holiday called Loi Kraton. And the man spoke, Oh, Mr. Nixon, you're very, very happy we see you here. Tonight, everyone walk along street, see, because Loi Kratong, they float these beautiful, beautiful uh, big banana leaves with a candle and various incense and things all through the canals, all through Thailand. You're very lucky we sit here, all the Klang, that means canal, they sit here and they, and they will say, you, Mr. Nixon, you're the happiest man here. Everyone love you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. Kept shaking hands with them. So you will be so famous tonight Lloyd Cratong, no more famous than with Mr. Nixon, who is here. Yes, yes, thank you. And he drew his hand, shook my hand, and I had no choice in this matter, being a non-spiritual. Uh, Mr. Nixon, thank you very, very much for being here. You will certainly be the most famous streetwalker in all of Bangkok today. <laughs> and he, without doing it, he just thanked me. Said, Thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure to meet you. And the Voice of America guy burst out. He, he couldn't control himself, and I stood there very, very nicely. And I thought, Fine. The second was the holy, the second non-spiritual occasion I had was with the holiest man in the world, the Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, excuse me. Um, it, I was supposed to meet him. I won't go through the details of meeting him, but I helped to write, they said if you go to Ladakh Dharmshala in India, where he is, where his little house is on the third story of this very interesting town, uh, you'll be able to probably have an interview with him. It's called an audience, but it'll be an interview. I said, that's fine. So I went there, and the foreign ministry of the Tibetan government in exile had given me somebody to... Um, accompany me to show me all the different things around Ladakh Ramshal. He was a lovely, delightful, wonderful person. He, invited, he introduced me to his wife, to his children. And the day before I was supposed to see His Holiness, he took me to his favorite temple. He said, Harry, I've got to ask you a question. I said, what's the question? He said, you know, we don't understand people who pray for themselves, for people to pray for success or more money or mothers to have children. We can't do that in Tibetan Buddhism. I said, I understand that. But I have a problem, and what's that? Because you're so sympathetic. I said, thank you. He said, I was having my final graduation exercises from the college to get, or to get into the foreign ministry. And I woke up that morning with the worst flu 
that I have ever had. I'm trying to do a Tibetan accent. It's very, very difficult. It became more Indian. Cause, and I woke up with the worst flu that it was possible to have. I was coughing, I was sneezing, I was wheezing, and I went to the temple, and I walked around three times, but <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't pray for myself, so I prayed that all the people in the world who had a flu, that they would be cured of that. <laughs> do you think that was a bad thing to do? I said, that was a beautiful thing to do. That was a wonderful thing to do. I said, now, let me tell you something. I'm going to see His Holiness tomorrow. Do you have a question you would like to ask him? And he told me a question which was brilliant, which I later asked His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Well, I screwed up the whole interview with the Dalai Lama. You're supposed to go there with a white silk handkerchief and give it to him. Now, later I found out that he is supposed to bless the handkerchief and give it back to you. I didn't know that. I thought he's got a lot of white silk handkerchiefs. He's got drawers, closets full of white silk. You know, honey, have you seen my white silk handkerchief? It's everywhere, everywhere. So I decided instead to bring him, th I knew he had a cassette machine in those days, so I brought him three cassettes of my three favorite music. I brought him a Schubert string quartet, I brought him a Mozart symphony, and as an American, I brought him something by Aaron Copeland, Billy the Kid, or Appalachian String or something. And he, he looked at it, he thanked me, sort of threw it on the table, and he looked at me as if to say, well, that's very nice, but where the fuck is my white handkerchief? That was in his eyes. Well, anyway, I said, I wanted to give you something which I love. He said, fine, thank you. The first 45 minutes, I had a 45-minute interview, and I had the right questions and the right answers, and it was all very nice. And then he said to me, you're from Hong Kong, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, I have been writing and writing to this liberal member of parliament in Hong Kong, Martin Lee, he's a lawyer, and he never responds to me. Why is that? I said, do you want to know the truth, Your Holiness? And he said, yes. I said, because the Chinese look at you as Americans looked at American Indians in the 19th century. You're a dirty hill tribe. He said, yes, I realize that. No one has said that directly to me before, but that is very good. Uh, can you stay longer? And I thought, if your holiness commands it, what choice do I have in this sort of case? He said, oh, that is wonderful. We then talked a little bit about politics and Hong Kong. He said, now I want you to ask me anything at all that you want. And I, it was an amazing talk because he began to speak about these American girls, they're so funny, they expect to see me fly out of the palace and into the air because I'm the Dalai Lama. I asked him about his diet. He says, of course I eat meat. Just because I'm the Dalai Lama doesn't mean that I have to be a vegetarian, does it? And then I said, now I've got one question to ask you. My person from the foreign ministry, and I mentioned his name, asked me to ask you a question. Now this was the interesting part. No one, I swear this is absolutely true. In the room was only His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and also in the room was another um, Lama who had been to Cambridge and Oxford. And whenever His Holiness was looking for a word, he would say it in Tibetan, and immediately would come back the translation, that's all. The following took place. I said, yes, my friend has asked me to ask you a question. Of course, this is so, so nice and so wonderful being with you. And I said, well, he said, I grew up knowing Buddhist principles, knowing not to harm others, knowing to be kind to every animal, to every plant, this is all part of me, but when I see the Chinese people, I want to, I want to shoot them, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and His Holiness said, and this was quick, he said, oh, shoot the buggers. No, 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 I don't mean that. I don't mean that. He said something then in Tibetan, and I laughed, and he laughed, and it was one of the funniest times. I don't think he would say that in public before. Anyway, anyway I turned this very spiritual man into a non-spiritual man. And to make things worse for this person who said, I'm not a spiritual person, I asked if I could take a picture with myself with him. He said, of course. And the other monk... Uh, said that he would take the picture. I said, well, this will be my first laminated photograph. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
and I'm, I'm here just to say, it, we, we look like two old queens. We look like two old queens himself dressed up. <laughs> it was very stupid. The third non-spiritual thing was when I worked for the Nazis. Now, this was in Hong Kong, and what the Germans had done, they have a German company uh, called Untermenschlich in their charming language, Untermenschlichgesellschaft, which means um, a factory of a number of companies. I cannot mention the name of this coffee company because this will go on YouTube and they're, they're a bit lit litigious. But what they did was after the Second World War, they took some of their officers from the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe, and from this SS, and from other <laughs> German organizations, and send them away from Germany to go to Asia to represent this coffee company, to take the Asian people and make them drink coffee instead of tea. And of course, they didn't have much of a job there, but they did commission me, Harry Rowling, to write a book about coffee. Well, this was an extraordinary thing because I didn't know anything about coffee at all, but I decided, yes, I wrote them a book of, filled with politics, with poetry. I had Hamlet and the coffee makers. It was a whole act from Hamlet, which I sort of made up. It was things, I, and, uh, naturally I quoted from, as we know, George Washington, who gave it the farewell address at the coffee house, from Jonathan Swift, from Bob Dylan, from everybody. And I even had a line from Bessie Smith, who after she had made love with some, some man said, well, I was his coffee and he was my cream and he put me so into the coffee. And of course the Germans, who did not like me at all, which I'm very happy about, said, who is this Bessie Schmidt? I said, oh, I'm uh, a I'm, I'm, I'm gross uh, Kunstler, a great artist. Oh, that is all right then. If she is a great artist, we will approve it. But then they said, you don't have anything about coffee in here. And I said, oh, coffee? Yeah, about the plants, the roasting, the, uh, the, the grinding. I said, they grow on plants, the coffee. Coffee. Yeah, yeah, you didn't know that coffee grows in the ground? I said, I mean, come to think of it, I guess you're right. So I added a few, I still wouldn't recognize a coffee plant from a vodka plant. However, it's still a very, it's a very, very nice book. And at the end, I put a poem, and I'll read you the poem. I actually rewrote it just, just before I came, but I liked it very, very much. There was a lot of poetry in here, and this will end things. Um, it's, how do I, by Elizabeth Barrett um, Browning, not, uh, not Elizabeth Barrett Roasting, not Browning. Or <laughs> how do I drink thee? Let me count the ways I drink thee for the taste and scent and roast my senses feel. Oh, I'm sorry. How do I drink thee? Let me count the ways I drink thee for the taste and scent and roast my senses feel. And even more engrossed, for time itself improves thy fine bouquets. The memories of coffee nights and days are pure solace. If by myself, my cup becomes my confidant, my lover, and my host. With friends, small rooms are Mozart-filled cafes. Thou encompasses worlds and histories. To Harar, Ethiopia, first I soar, then Java and Versailles, to king and pope and sultan. Genies, starlit mysteries, have supped of thee to world to fly, so rich, so fervent, and so designed, that this tiny being, our mind, our cosmos, glorify. <laughs> now, as for this woman who said, I have no spirituality, I can only say that we, Philip and Shakespeare and the Dalai Lama and anybody who's cleaning the street of my dog poop and anyone at all, our molecules, our brains, our neurons, grow and change and become part of us and for practical or impractical reasons our humanity is spiritual enough for anything. Thank you very much.